The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Did Jesus say, wear the cross anywhere in the Bible? Or did he say, bear the cross? A whole lot easier to wear one than bear one. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Everlasting Gospel video series. I remember when I was a boy, one of the highlights of my youth was maybe once or twice a week, I would be given a box of Cracker Jacks. Some of you remember when there wasn't the prolifer proliferation of candy choices that we have today. There are only a few things you could get. A Babe Ruth, a box of Cracker Jacks, and I forget what else, Hershey Bar. And what was the best thing about the Cracker Jacks? Prize inside. And uh, every now and then, of course, they'd have to upgrade their prizes. And I remember at one point they went through a series of prizes that were charms. And you had to get your own bracelet, but they would supply these little, uh, they were probably plastic, charms that were in the uh, Cracker Jacks box. And um, each of them represented some different power. They had, you know, a uh, shoe that was supposed to help you run faster, and a little horseshoe and give you good luck. And um, I don't remember what all of them were, but I, I ate a whole lot of Cracker Jacks trying to fill up a charm bracelet with all these things so I could have the powers that were connected with it. Well, that'll set the stage a little bit for what I have to share this morning. And the message is titled, Unlucky Charms. Unlucky Charms. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 13. And I'm going to be reading two verses, verse 18. I'm reading out of the New King James Version here. Verse 18 and verse 20. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the women who sew magic charms on their sleeves and make veils for their heads, the heads of the people, on the height to hunt souls. And then verse 20. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against your magic charms by which you hunt for souls like birds. It's talking about these charms. What in the world is that dealing with? Turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings. How many of you know the story of the bronze serpent? 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. First, I'll give you the background for this. You remember in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were bitten by these serpents and they were dying. And so God, God, instructed Moses to take a bronze serpent, to fashion one with their um, um, metal workers, put it on a shepherd's staff, a pole, hold it up so if the people looked at it, they would be healed from the venom of the snake bite. And of course, this was a type of Christ. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the precursor story to John 3.16. Well, now I want you to fast forward about a thousand years. It's talking about the reign of Hezekiah. Was Hezekiah a good king or bad king? Good king, godly king. And listen, what he did. Part of the revival that Hezekiah affected, he removed the high places and broke down the pillars. These were the pagan implements of worship that had found their way into the kingdom again. And he cut down the Asherah pole. And he broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Why would you break the bronze serpent that Moses made? Wasn't it God's instruction? Moses was a good guy. Why break it? I'll tell you why. Keep reading. For in those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he, Hezekiah, called it Nehushtan, which means a piece of bronze. They had made a god out of it, and that was never his plan. They'd begun to worship it and revere it, and it was distracting them, and it really had become an idol. So he broke it to pieces and said, it's just a piece of metal. He never intended you to worship it. The Bible forbids idolatry. 
Do we sometimes get sidetracked with good luck charms and uh, some of those emblems in our culture? Let me tell you what I want to talk about. I'm going to tell you what I want to talk about, then I'm going to tell you about it, and then I'll tell you what it is I talked about. <laughs> I want to talk about jewelry. When did people start wearing jewelry? Do you think Eve was walking along in the Garden of Eden one day and said, oh look, a piece of gold. I think I'll put it in my ear. <laughs> Why would she do that? I mean, when did it start? The best they can tell when they try to trace back the history of people wearing minerals, and I'm not even getting to the piercing yet, that's later, was because it was associated with the various gods that they worship. There's no, uh, uh, no example of it really before the flood. You find in history more and more of it appears after the flood. And it's often with serpents and things. The sun and the moon were primary objects of worship. This is an emblem. Um, I looked at some artifacts that they had online and one of these was connected with moon worship, one was sun worship. Matter of fact, the Egyptians, one of their principal gods was the sun. And you can see everywhere, I think I've got this slide of Horus, the falcon god, but always above their head, they've got this solar disk Matter of fact, uh, many of the halos you see around medieval art are taken from ancient paganism, and those were solar disks. I mean, nothing in the Bible talks about folks going around with glows of gold behind their heads. Uh, and it all springs from sun worship. A lot of it, a shocking amount of the ancient jewelry has demonic symbols in it. It's serpents and dragons. It's amazing how much they've recovered of these serpents and dragons. And so... Some of it was, the jewelry was money. Matter of fact, when uh, Eliezer went to get a wife for Isaac, it says he took a bracelet off and he gave it to her and it tells the weight of the bracelet because it was a value of money. They didn't have paper money back then. And um, sometimes they wore it and they got into trouble doing that. And we'll talk a little more about that in a little bit. But now we're living in an age where idolatry and spiritualism is still connected with minerals and stones and most jewelry is made out of various forms of minerals unless you've got plastic jewelry and if you do you probably don't tell people uh, I am aware of what's out there in the movies I don't go to the theater but all you got to do is fly on an airplane and you, unless you put a bag over your head it's hard not to know what's out there and they had this recent trilogy of blockbusters called Lord of the uh huh you see you know too right it's all built around a, a ring. Uh, Titanic was a blockbuster, and it's talking about this necklace. The whole thing is built around looking for this necklace, and it's finally offered to the sea, and the rings are offered to the volcano. And you'd be surprised if you look everything from King Arthur's sword. Uh, it's got magical powers. People are very superstitious, and they start to become attracted to these charms and things. And I think that we invite I think that we invite evil influences subconsciously without even realizing it by embracing some of this. Now, let's go to the Bible. Some of you remember a story in the Bible, Genesis chapter 35, it's Jacob. And you'll see there's a connection between idolatry and various forms of jewelry. Specifically, earrings are mentioned here. Jacob's sons had gotten into big trouble. They just slaughtered the people of Shechem. And Jacob now needs to reconsecrate himself and his family to the Lord. And God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel. Who knows what the word Bethel means? House of God. Arise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar unto God. I want you to return to me. Reconsecrate your family to me. The God who appeared to you, I made a covenant with you. You're drifting. When you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Then Jacob said to his household, and to all who were with him, not just his family, but all the others, the servants and stuff that had joined him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments and let us arise, be pure, and go to Bethel. Let's arise and go to the house of God and I'll make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way in which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the foreign gods that were in their hand and the rings that were in their ears. Did you catch the association that is made between idols, gods, and rings in their ears? Evidently, I mean, if there was nothing wrong, why did he say take it off? 
And then they buried it under an oak tree, and then they met, went and they met with the Lord. Do you think they went back and dug up their idols again later? Was it just for that one church service? He said, dwell there in Bethel. They didn't go back. And I think some of us would do well to find an oak tree and dig a hole and uh, make an offering. Does it matter what we wear? When you get to the book of Revelation and God identifies the true church and the apostate church, through what symbols does he identify the two churches? Symbol of woman, two women. One is in Revelation 12, one is in Revelation 17. Through both prophecies, neither of the women speak. The way we know which is the true woman and which is the apostate church is based on what? What they're wearing. One is clothed with God-made light. She's standing on the moon. She's clothed with the sun. She's got 12 stars hovering above her head, representing the sun, the moon, and the stars, the light that God made. This is natural light that God made. God made the sun. He made the moon. He made the stars. Jesus said to the church, you are the light of the world. It's God's light. The other woman is wearing the gold and the pearls and the precious uh, uh, or the purple and scarlet and, and it's, there's nothing divine about the illumination she has. It's all worldly. They may both be beautiful, but one is the beauty of the world and one is the beauty of God. 1 Timothy 2, verse 9 and 10, Paul said, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness, that means humility, and sobriety, not with broidered, they used to weave gold in their hair, not with broidered or hair or gold, not with gold or pearls or with costly array. That means we don't need clothing that's flamboyant and, and uh, distracting, but that which becomes women professing godliness with good works. It should be, it's not that these things are good luck charms, it's the obedience in the life that God is looking for. 1 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4. Who is adorning? He's speaking of godly women, but this applies to men too. Let it not be the outward adorning of the plating in the hair of wearing of gold. Let it not be the wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is not corruptible. Even the ornament, here's the ornament God wants us to wear. Here's, here's the uh, lucky charm. Oh, I shouldn't even say that. A meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. It's what's supposed to be on the inside. And I'll be very honest with you. Forgive me for being so frank, but I have never yet met a man who said, boy, I really like that girl. Yeah, why? I think it's her jewelry. <laughs> or I've never heard a man, I mean, I've sat around with a lot of men just talking like men talk, and I've never heard a man say, you know, she'd be more beautiful if she wore more jewelry. That's a myth. If anyone out here, ladies, if you didn't know that, surprise, surprise. But it, I don't know any man who has ever thought that. It doesn't, you know. The Bible says a, a beautiful woman without discretion is like a jewel of gold in a pig's nose. It's in Proverbs somewhere, but I don't remember where. I mean... You know, it's what's in the heart. You can put all kinds of jewels on somebody and it doesn't make them more beautiful in the sight of God and quite frankly, it doesn't make them more beautiful in the sight of men either. Now, they're, you know, women will sometimes say, ooh, isn't that pretty? Hey, they got a jewelry channel. I just went up to Covalo and, and um, we got one of those great big old satellite dishes and we're not paying for anything. So you got to kind of surf the chi sky and see if there's any news. I wanted to get the president's address this week, see if I could see it. So I'm moving the satellite around. The only thing I get was this jewelry channel. <laughs> any men enjoy watching the jewelry channel out there? But if we don't have a problem, we got a whole channel dedicated to looking at jewelry on television. And they almost sell it, making it sound like there are magical qualities to these different things. It's enchanting. And these things are beautiful. I mean, did God make gold? Did God make pearls? The high priest. What's on the vestments of the high priest? The high priest has got these beautiful garments and it's got gold and, and uh, beautiful stones that were made for the, um, 
representing the different tri tribes. And on his shoulders, he had two great jewels that were the, the Urim and the Thummim, and they would consult God, and, and he spoke in a way. That was a symbol for prayer and mediation of Christ. But God never asked anybody else in Israel to do that. Matter for, well, I'll get to that in just a minute, talking about the Day of Atonement. What are we going to walk on in heaven? Gold. Does God like jewels? I mean, what's the 12 foundations of the New Jerusalem? Beautiful, precious stone. We're going to walk on gold. What are the gates made of? Pearl. Did the devil make these things or God? They're beautiful things. You could love and appreciate them. The question is, do we hang them on our bodies? Oh, by the way, before I leave heavenly examples, how was Lucifer adorned? Did you know the Bible says, if you read there in Ezekiel, every precious stone was thy covering. And look where it got him. So, here. <laughs> you know, I came back from India, and the, the church there, some of them have a little bit of a, of a moral dilemma because a lot of the ladies, they wear a jewel in their nose signifying whether or not they're married. And, uh, but let me just tell you, for the record, it is not practical. I won't go into details, but those dear ladies struggle with that nose jewel, and it causes a problem. Uh, I don't think God ever intended for us to add any holes to the existing ones He designed us with. <laughs> he designed us perfectly with the appropriate number, and I don't think He wants us to add to that or diminish from it. Uh, it causes problems. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so He would take that away, nose jewels. Now, you might say, Pastor Doug, but everybody's doing it. It's, it's, it's so prevalent. Listen to what Jesus said. Luke 16, 15. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Just because something might be highly esteemed in the world and even in the church does not mean that God looks at it the same way. Matter of fact, one of the characteristics of the church in the last days is the Laodicean condition you find in Revelation chapter 3, which is not knowing that they are poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked, thinking they are rich and increased with goods. And what is one of the reasons they may think they're rich and increased with goods? Because they're wearing the riches. And God says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. They don't have the humility and the mind of Christ. Body piercing. You think a pastor needs to talk about this in our day and age? Uh, I went to India, saw some of this when I was here just uh, last November. In these pagan cultures where they worship uh, the pagan gods, thousands of gods, they mutilate and punish themselves to please the gods. They hang all these charms and their symbols for everything they're doing, hooks all through their bodies, and they pull things with it. And it's just, you know, some people come out to look, but they're, it's a religious festival. They're not doing it for entertainment. If you go to Nepal, you'll find there that for a Hundreds, if not thousands of years, it was a custom to surround the ear with special charms, and the purpose was to prevent evil spirits from speaking to you. Africa. Again, a lot of you, every, I could go from tribe to tribe, and there'd be all different kinds of examples I could give. I just captured this one where they're piercing, and all those things are supposed to have spiritual significance. But is it Christian significance? That's my question. If it's not Christian, what kind of spirit is it? Burma. You've probably seen this before. Again, and actually their necks aren't longer. What they do is they start adding these rings when they're young and it basically pushes their collarbones back down in their torso. They have very short life expectancy. It's extremely unhealthy. But again, religious purposes for these things. Leviticus 19.28. You shall not make... Now, that to me sounds like a command. I mean, when God says, thou shalt not, it means thou shalt not. It's like all the other commands. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead. They used to do it for the dead. It was what the pagans did. He says, I am the Lord. You are holy. When the prophets of Baal wanted to get the attention of their God, what did they ultimately do? They jumped up and down on the altar and they cut themselves. So you want that verse? 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 28. Till the blood ran out. When Jesus encountered a man filled with a legion of demons, what was one of the characteristics of his demonic possession? Mark 5, verse 5. 
And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Deuteronomy 14, verse 1 and 2, You are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves, for you are a holy people. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not to deface God's temple. And yet, what do we see in the world around us today? So, oh, by the way, you know who does believe in body piercing? The devil. How did Jesus die? Jesus died at the hands of Satan's piercing. Another reason for us to consider this, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 12, we don't want to be a stumbling block. Now, I told you, there's going to be a lot of good Christian men and women that have worn various amounts of jewelry for different purposes, and sometimes they might say, well, it was, you know, it's a wedding ring or it was a family heirloom or whatever. I, I mean, we're not here to judge. God knows the heart. Amen? And I'm not here to judge anyone's heart. I just need to be faithful to preach the word and get you to think. What you do about what you hear is, is between you and the Lord. But I'd like to challenge you to think about not just you and what you're doing for you, but what are other people seeing? And you might say, well, look, I just wear a couple of little tasteful pearl earrings. Now I'm talking to the men. <laughs> Could be, huh? And the women. But someone else might look at you, and let's face it, are there people who struggle with insecurity? Are there people who struggle with low self-worth? It's a fact that some people think it's a fact. They think they're going to raise their perceived value by putting valuables on, and they're trying to raise their perceived beauty or their, their perceived worth by putting these things on, and they go out, they go, they go hog wild, and they start dressing up like, I won't use any names. Ultimately, friends, there's going to be a big liquidation sale someday. Did you know that? Isaiah chapter 2, verse 20. Verse 21, in that day, speaking of the judgment day, a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made each one for themselves, and cast them away to the rats and the bats and the moles. Boy, I tell you, if you're going to unload, do it now when you can invest that stuff and put it into God's work. You know, we want to be good wit witnesses. And um, here, bear with me for just a moment here. I'll be back. I went shopping yesterday. If I concluded this message <laughs> like this, would you find it distracting? You would? Why? Just a little too big? If it was smaller, it'd be okay? But everyone's got varying ideas how big and how small it should be. Did you have a problem before I put on any? No, because if you don't have it, it's not a problem. But wait, I'm not done. You know, I work with some of you. See, I can't even get my hand in my pocket with this thing on. I worked with the Navajos for a year and a half. And uh, they were and made the most beautiful turquoise jewelry. And uh, I would say to them, I shared this message. I've shared it my whole Christian experience because I think it's a biblical message. And they would say, Pastor Doug, it's different for us because this is our money. And it's true. They would make this beautiful turquoise, silver. I think we got it right there, yeah. The turquoise and silver jewelry. And I'd say, well, it's fine to have money, but does God want us to wear it? Where would you rather see this? In the church offering envelope or like this? <laughs> no, really. If you were an angel and you know in heaven, what's the asphalt in heaven? Go. Would, would we wear asphalt on our bodies? In California, I know, but... I do these things because then people... It's the only part of the ser sermon they'll remember. My sermon today is not going to change everything, friends. I'm just hoping that I could help hold the flood back a little bit by my small voice. I hope you take this tape and you circulate it among God's people, not to beat them up with it, but as a truth that we want to represent Jesus in these last days before he comes, amen? The whole idea is this is just one little thing important of many things where we in our lives attempt to become more like Christ and less like the world. That's my concern. That's my appeal. There's just so much compromise going on, friends.
Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Hello, friends. The program you're watching is the culmination of a dream and a mission. Let me tell you about the mission. Amazing Facts believe strongly in the Great Commission given by Christ in Matthew chapter 28 to share the wonderful news of salvation with the entire world. There are billions of people on this planet that are in desperate need of a change in their lives. We believe that a spiritual encounter with God is the only way to affect real change. Now let me tell you about the dream. Amazing Facts started in 1966 after the founder of this ministry, Joe Cruz, decided to take the mission of sharing God's Word with everyone personally. Since then, we have shared this wonderful message about God with millions around the world through our free Bible school, free Bible study guides, our television, radio, and internet ministries. During Pastor Doug Batchelor's 10-day health and gospel mission trip to Southeast India, we witnessed over 15,000 individuals surrender their lives over to Christ. We are currently building 70 churches in that region. If you've been blessed by this program and would like to join with us in this mission of taking the gospel to the world, why not call to become a partner in evangelism? Our partners have decided to consistently contribute to our efforts in sharing this message that has changed not only my life, but the lives of countless others. If you'd like to join our partners, share a testimony or contribute a gift, contact us today. Friends, the most amazing fact of all is that God loves us and cares for us and that He has a plan for your life. Prayerfully consider joining our efforts. Until next time, may God continue to hold you in the palm of His hand. Because the church did not understand the prophecies about the first coming of the Messiah, they did not accept Him, they did not receive Him. Is it possible the church is going to make the same mistake again? Could it be that because the church does not understand the prophecies regarding the second coming, that they will not be ready for Him when He comes again? Friends, the subject of jewelry and its place in the life of a Bible Christian is not a new debate. For centuries, Christians were known not only for good deeds, but also for their modesty and appearance. Yet within the church today, there seems to be a growing trend of external adornment. The emphasis seems to be more on wearing the cross than bearing the cross. We don't have enough time in this broadcast to say everything we'd like to say on this interesting subject. So our gift for you today is a pocket booklet I've written called Jewelry, How Much Is Too Much? We'll send you this pocketbook absolutely free. Simply call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 141. Or you can write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 141, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have for today's program, but I'd like to leave you with a closing scripture from Romans 13, 14. It says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. The preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated.